Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today, we'll talk with Matt McCall. He's one of my favorite investors, and he has recently joined us at Stansberry Research. In the mailbag today, really good questions around the complex topic of when to sell. And the mailbag is a conversation, so talk to me. Call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357, and hear your voice on the show. For my opening rant this week, the trade of the last decade was to buy disruptive technology. I'll tell you what I think the next trade of the next decade is going to be. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. The trade of the decade. Well, it's a it's a convenient sounding phrase. I don't know if I'm talking about five years, 10 years, 15, but I, I, I'm comfortable calling it the trade of the next decade. Trade of the last decade was to buy disruptive technologies. You know, you could have you could have bought almost anything. I mean, if you bought Tesla a decade ago, wow, you'd be up huge. And even the big companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, you know, they disrupted media, they disrupted brick and mortar commerce. It, it's been an amazing decade for disruptive technologies and for investors in them. For the next decade, I think it's going to be different. I think the trade of the next decade, I'll just call it real assets. But I think there's really two parts to it. And I've talked about both parts, but let's just put them both together and call it the trade of the decade. And the two parts are commodities versus stocks are cheaper than they've ever been versus stocks going back at least 30, 40 years. And I've seen charts that are longer, but my data is 30 years, actually. And also value stocks versus growth stocks, you know, and a lot of those growth stocks are the disruptive technology stocks. And everybody, that's one of the problems is that everybody knows that growth is great and everybody knows disruptive technology is great and it's reflected in the valuations. So value stocks, things like, you know, mining companies and manufacturers and even banks and other things are the value stocks are cheaper relative to growth stocks than any time going back at least 30 years. And again, I've seen longer charts, but my date is 30 years. I'm pulling it out of Bloomberg. And that's good enough because, you know, we we only we get these, you know, time to buy buy value events, you know, every decade or so, right? It was time to buy value at the peak of the dot-com boom in 1999, 2000, right? And so value did great and it sort of peaked all those, you know, home builders or another, another value type sector, all the home builders and banks and, and, uh, you know, mining stocks and things just got absolutely obliterated in the financial crisis. Uh, and then, you know, mining kind of came back, but then got obliterated, you know, a couple of years later. And so then for the last decade, it's been, you know, a decade of growth and disruptive technology. So there's value names and commodity oriented names. I think that's going to be the trade of the decade. And right now, as far as I can tell, the thing I'm most excited about that I've recently put my own money into was silver. The silver stocks are just down, down, down. They've just really fallen apart. And gold stocks too, right? And those those are slightly different than the commodity, the strict commodity play. The, you know, the useful things like copper and iron ore and, you know, other things like food and, and other commodities. Because they're mon they have a monetary component. S silver has is a useful industrial metal with a monetary component. And gold is is uh, useful for jewelry, and most of the gold that we that we use is used for jewelry. But it also has a huge kind of 
you could call it speculative, but for me, it's a long-term wealth preservation monetary component. I'm not a speculator in gold. I'm a long-term preserver of wealth, buyer of gold. But when the gold stocks get get cheap, when they fall apart and they're you know performing really poorly, that's when I want to buy them. Because as a, a previous guest and a good friend of mine for the past two decades or two and a half decades or so, Rick Rule often says, and we've had Rick on the program not too long ago, he says, when it comes to gold stocks or, or silver or commodities in general, you are either a contrarian or you're a victim, right? The victims in the commodity trade, they only come in after it's performed exceedingly well. But the contrarians come in after the stocks have performed poorly. And that's what you have to do. You have to bite that bullet and buy when they're down. And we're in a funny place right now because silver and gold look really attractive from a contrarian standpoint. But if you look at like the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, it's up 40% this year. I mean, commodities have screamed, okay? So it, it doesn't feel real contrarian right now. Oil is up. Uh, pretty dramatically this year too. So it's not looking like a big, you know, contrarian trade right now. So maybe there will be better entry points for the trade of the decade in some of these commodities. But I think you can certainly start. And I think the same trend that affects those non-monetary commodities will affect gold and silver. And I just think that um, these things run in cycles. Cycles happen. And it's just a part of it's again, it's a part of human nature. All of this stuff that we talk about investing, right? We, you know, we talk about when to sell and how people tend to sell at the wrong time. Human nature, right? People get excited about something everyone else is excited about, usually at the wrong moment to buy. Human nature. So, also in human nature is the simple fact that eventually we find out we went too far. And I think people will find out they went too far with this disruptive technology thing as an investment, you know, as a technological trend. The trends keep going, right? The internet didn't stop. It just got better and better after the dot-com crash. But the equity sure got murdered. And I think that something like that is going to happen again. So I think the thing to buy ahead of that are the commodity-oriented names right now, the silver and gold names and and you know, maybe look for some good oil names here and there if you can find them. And that's it, the trade of the decade, real assets. You heard it here, probably not first, but, <laughs> but you heard it here. Now it's time for my quote of the week. And this comes from Hyatt Brown of the insurance brokerage firm, Brown & Brown, which we recommended in the Extreme Value Newsletter. My old friend Chris Mayer loves this company. He's bought it for his clients. It's a great business. It's one of the all-time great businesses. Low CapEx. It's just people in offices with telephones and computers. But it'll all, there will always be a need for it because they mostly sell insurance to businesses. And it tends to be a more intensive, information-intensive, specific kind of coverage that requires a lot of interaction with a knowledgeable agent. So I think it'll be around for a long time. I think it'll learn high returns on capital for a long time, and I think it'll learn consistent margins and gush free cash flow for a long time. Uh, and Brown and Brown will be one of the best ones. So Hyatt Brown was giving a talk recently, and he he said this quote, which I think is just brilliant. He said, "In the morning in Africa, a cheetah w awakes knowing it will have to run faster than the slowest gazelle, or it will starve." In the morning in Africa, a gazelle awakes knowing it will have to run faster than the fastest cheetah or it will die. In the morning when you get up, whether you are a cheetah or a gazelle, you better wake up running. It sounds harsh, but it ain't. It's like any athletic team. You get up and you do it and you do it and you do it. And if you do it well, you will last. That's Hyatt Brown of Brown and Brown. Great quote. I love it. If you, in the morning when you get up, whether you are a chief or a gazelle, you better wake up running. Okay, let's talk to my friend, Matt McCall. Let's do it right now. I've been following Matt McCall for years. I don't know how many years. 
but it's not for any of the reasons that you might think. Matt takes a much, much different approach to stocks and investing than I do. And his track record will absolutely blow you away. He's found more than 40, 40, 1,000% 40, winners in his 20 year career. He even recommended Bitcoin in 2014. It went up a hundred times after that. On October 20th, Matt is going to give us his newest big market prediction, and he's going to tell us the name of a tiny little company that he says could go down in history as Stansberry's most successful stock market recommendation ever. That's a bold claim with most people. I wouldn't care. I'd ignore it. But with Matt, you pay attention. And you can bet I will be there. I will be tuned in and writing down the name of that stock. And I want to see what he has to say about it. And best of all, Matt's going to share all this information with you 100% free. You don't have to pay anything. For all the details, and if you want to sign up for the big event when Matt reveals this stock, just go to www.mattbroadcast.com. Again, that's www.mattbroadcast.com. All right, it's time for our interview today. Today's guest is Matt McCall. Matt was a stockbroker at Charles Schwab, one of the world's largest brokerage firms. He's the founder of Penn Financial Group, an asset management firm for high net worth individuals, the author of two books on investing, The Swing Traders Bible, Strategies to Profit from Market Volatility, and The Next Great Bull Market, How to Pick Winning Stocks and Sectors in the New Global Economy, which was a top-selling investment book for more than two years. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal and countless other financial websites and has appeared over 1,000 times as a featured financial expert on Fox News, Fox Business, Bloomberg, CNBC, and CNN. But most importantly, I am pleased to welcome Matt as the newest editor here at Stansberry Research. So welcome to the fold, Matt. You're one of us now. Thank you so much, Stan. Yeah, thank you so much. Great to be back on. Yeah, so you, I, I think I've done like five appearances, all of them on Fox Business. And it was like the biggest pain in the neck in the world. It ate up half my day. It was ridiculous. You did it a thousand times? Are you a glutton? Yeah, they were paying me. So I, uh, I, was, okay. I, I didn't do it for okay. free. <laughs> I was being paid. Um, and I lived about three blocks from the studio. Yeah, they lived about, I lived about three blocks from the studio. So it made it very convenient on the way home. Uh, the subway actually stopped in the basement of Fox. The next stop was next to my house. So it made it easy. And I got to tell you, I got burnt out, though. And that's why you know, I kind of changed to what I was doing with the newsletter world, because it, it, a little more freedom to, to talk about really what I want to talk about versus the you know, the narrative that the big media is pushing. You know, were you sort of encouraged or um, kind of led down the path of the narrative in, in your thousand appearances? Yeah, you know, at, at first it was just a like a guest for like a three minute spot here and there, and they'd call and say, "Hey, Matt, are are you this? Are you bullish on this? Hey, Matt, do you think Obama's going to ruin the economy?" And of course, you know, back then I wanted to get on camera, so I said, "Sure, Obama's the worst thing ever. He's going to ruin the economy," because <laughs> so, I knew they'd put me on. <laughs> so yeah, yeah there, there was definitely times where they would steer you, or they'd ask me for my thought on on a topic, let's say, whether it be political, economic, stock market. And I give my top and they, okay, thanks. We'll get to you next time. You know, they, they were looking for me to give one, one answer. As okay. I got further along my career, when I was co-hosting a daily show, uh, we were definitely pushed, you know, to, to speak a certain narrative. Um, <clears throat> and that's the one reason I left. My contract was up. I was working on just day-to-day -day contract. And it got to the point where I just wasn't comfortable anymore uh, going on national television, speaking certain ways. And, you know, at the end of the day, all you have is your name. And, and if your name gets ruined, which it could be happening pretty quickly in this world. So I decided it was time for me to, uh, to move on to greener pastures. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. Over the years, I, I feel like I've made a similar kind of a transition because after a while, like you, you think what you think and that's all there is to it. I mean, um, it is not independent thinking like one of the most important things about being a great investor. It's like, where, where, where is, where's that idea in, in all this narrative pushing? 
You know, that that's a great point. And, you know, I bash the media a lot. And sometimes, you know, I don't like to be negative all the time and, and, and say all negative things about the media. The problem is, Dan, it's very tough for me to come up with some positive things. You know, I have a lot of great friends who still work at Fox and other places, and they don't like to hear me say it. But, you know, these are people that, you know, I go over and I see their children. Like, these are good, good friends. Um, but at the same time, when it comes to investing, they're not looking out for the retail investor, the little guy, if you will, out there. Because, number one, th there's only certain stocks they can talk about, a certain size, um, and it's going to be the same stuff. Apples, the Amazons of the world, you know, the, the big names. Um, the other thing is they don't vet these, quote, unquote, experts that they put on. They, they just let them come on because they may look good on TV. They may sound good. They may have a good title. Yeah. They may know the PR firm, whatever it might be. You know, there's no real reason as to why somebody goes on TV more than somebody else. Um, and then at the end of the day, a lot of the guys, not to bash CNBC, have never managed money in their life. They have no skin in the game. There's no ramifications that they come up with bad ideas. Then they tell you, hey, I'm a long-term investor, Dan. You know, these are long-term ideas. Four days later, the market's down 1%, and they're telling you to sell the same stock they recommended three days ago. So, you know, at home, you can't sit there and expect that that person is looking out for your best interest. And finally, the networks, everything's about money. The networks, how do they make money? Advertising. How do they get more advertising dollars? More eyeballs. So it has to be sensationalized. They can't go on the end and say, hey, market's down a half a percent today. Not much going on. Tune in tomorrow. It has to be, my God, the world's ending. The market's down a half a percent. And they're only going to put on quote unquote experts that will tell you the world's ending because that's going to get clicks and eyeballs. And so you know, I, I feel bad for the people at home that truly look up to the people on TV and take their advice. And again, I'm not going to name names, but we all know who we're referring to on CNBC that <laughs> yeah. flops more than any politician I know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We do. Yeah, I think we've kind of beat that horse to death. We all know the media is not a trustworthy source of financial advice, the mainstream financial type media. But remind us again, like I know you've been on the show before and our, our, some of our listeners are familiar with you, but um, let's do the Matt McCall refresher. If we were sitting at a bar and I said, well, Matt, what kind of investor are you? Um, what would you tell me? You know, I, I, this changes because a, a lot, I used to say growth investor, but that kind of pushes people off because that's not necessarily true. Um, I'll take it in, in, from a different angle, Dan. I, I'm, I'm somewhat of an amateur futurist. So I, I, looked at, I like to look ahead 5, 10, 15 years out and use a top-down approach uh, to investing. You know, a lot of Wall Street's bottoms up. They'll look at the specifics and fundamentals of a company and not care as much about what uh, sector, what trend it's in. You know, an example is, okay, there's a great retailer, brick and mortar retailer. The problem is, is do you see a lot of growth in brick and mortar retail or would you rather be in e-commerce? You know, I'm going to lead towards e-commerce and I think the odds of picking an e-commerce company that does well are much higher than a brick and mortar. And don't get me wrong, uh, we've owned some brick and mortars along the, along the time and I think there's a lot of great ones out there. The odds just aren't as good. So I'm going to look into the future and at anything that I believe can, um, can give back above average growth, and that is uh, on the cusp of uh, innovation. So let's, I'll call myself an innovation investor, where I'm looking for disruptors, um, sectors that will change the world, and sectors and trends, mega trends, let's call them, that regardless of the government, regardless of any pandemics, will continue uh, to grow. A uh, very easy example is the transportation industry. Regardless of what happens between now and the end of the, what I call the roaring 2020s, we are going to see more electric vehicles on the road. I mean, I, I, whether you love it, you hate it, or, or you're indifferent, I don't think there's anything that you and I, Dan, could do to change that fact there's going to be more electric vehicles on the road. So from my standpoint, I will then look at, okay, what are the investment implications of that? You know, very simply, you think, oh, what about Tesla, Volkswagen's leading the way, a few others. Then I, I, that, that's kind of the easy top, but I like to take more of a, uh, what you call picks and shovels approach to it. Okay, what about the battery makers? Because the batteries need to get better for EVs to really continue to grow. What about all the sensors? What about all the software? What about all the chassis that now have to be uh, switched over to electric vehicles? There's so many other plays along the way that I think will be huge winners. And that's, that's my investing approach. So I'll look for these mega trends, whether it be the uh, transportation, whether it be genomics, uh, whether it be 
quantum computing, cloud computing, etc. You know, all the all the big trends that are going on right now. Are you a Tesla bull, Matt? I am a Tesla bull, and I have been for a very long time, a very very long time. I, you know, the reason I became a Tesla bull, Dan, is not because of Tesla itself. And this was, I'm trying to think, the first time I recommended. I think it was in '09, <clears throat> and um, it was because of Elon Musk. It was it was one of the one of those times where. You know, back in high school, I used to skip school all the time and go to Philadelphia Park and bet on the ponies. Never won, but there's this old guy there, always won. And he pulled us aside one day and he says, listen, guys, you got to bet on the jockey. He goes, you know, those, those, these, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he always was there every day. I think his last name was Prada. Always winning, always winning. Didn't matter about the horse. He bet on the jockey. And Elon Musk was a bet on the jockey. You know, I, I believe in him. I think he's, don't get me wrong. He could be going back to Mars because he's from there. He's a bit goofy, to say the least. But I also think he's a visionary. And I think he'll go down you know, in history as a great visionary. So my bet for Tesla was on him. And I recently put out a report, maybe about a year ago. You know, I think Tesla is a three to $4 trillion company by the end of this decade. And, I, and that, a lot of that has to do with not the cars as much, but the battery storage. I think there's such huge upside for energy storage and battery storage and, and i and i see them making you know headways and when it comes to that interesting a bet on the jockey uh, he's a controversial jockey <laughs> yes to say the least <laughs> yeah I, I mean you know not just not just as a person i mean as a person he's really impressive he's got all these big projects going and he's, he seems to pull them out of his back pocket you know and so he, he's clearly an impressive guy uh but I mean, as a CEO, as the CEO of a public company, he, he's a controversial figure to say the least. I mean, I suppose the the most famous example at this point was the, uh, you know, the the funding secured tweet. That is not something you would ever like. I never thought I would see that from the CEO of a public company saying funding secured when, uh, you know, anything but secured. So, but that he doesn't, that doesn't bother you though. The, the visionary comes no, with the crazy stuff, right? It does. Yeah. It doesn't bother me as much. I mean, uh, I, I'm not saying I'm anti SEC. I think the SEC concentrates on the wrong people a lot of, a lot of times. I, 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 I agree with you though. I think the perfect situation would be bring somebody else in as a CEO, you know, a little crazy like him, but not to that extent and make a new role, the CVO, chief visionary officer, and let him still be obviously a huge part of it, largest shareholder, most likely. And let him be the visionary. But don't when it comes down to day-to-day -day operations and tweets, no, do not tweet about Tesla or anything else. You know, cut him off there. So I, I agree with that. Yeah. All right. I don't want to get hung up on Tesla either. Okay, so megatrends. Is there one of them right now that just screams at you as like you can't not be invested here? You know, what's the is there one that's just you know, crying out that's obvious to you. Well, I'll mention two because I'm not going to go into transportation again, but transportation is one for me where um, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, people thought I was crazy three years ago pitching flying cars, but, you know, they call them EVTOLs now. Uh, they, I sat in one in, in, in CES two years ago, I guess it is now. Um, it was made by Hyundai. I think it was a Hyundai and Uber. I sat in one made by Bell Labs. They're amazing and they're going to be here because the thing is when it comes to infrastructure on the roads for AVs, you look at the sky, it's pretty wide open. And, and I, 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 I was sitting in a, in a uh, building in New York not too long ago. I looked at it and I was telling people, I said, very soon we're going to see flying cars stopping on all the tops of these buildings and that's how you're going to get around. Um, you know, really they're kind of like drones, flying drones. But um, th so to me, I think transportation is probably the, the one no brainer out there. Um, you know, another one is going to be uh, a blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I, I think that's a no-brainer as well. When it comes to, to blockchain, I think let's look at those two different ways. Blockchain, I just spoke uh, this week, Dan, to a group of financial advisors. So not guys like you and I that kind of think outside the box, but financial advisors. And my topic was cryptocurrencies. Can you imagine me trying to talk cryptocurrencies with this group? I was, I was like, I, I love speaking in public. I was scared to get in front of this group. But at the time, they had a breakout session and you could choose if you wanted to go to marketing, investing, or cryptos. My table was fuller than anything else, like 90% of people, because it's interesting if it's, if, it's, if it's told the right way. And you start with blockchain. You know, blockchain has been around it's for, for many, many years. You know, IBM has been working with blockchain for a long, long time. You know, it's, it's basically a digital ledger. And an easy way to put it that I try to explain to people is it eliminates the middleman. And the middleman has been fleecing human beings for 
thousands of years and we need to get rid of that. And, and th that will, any, any technology, Dan, that will allow things to be faster, um, cheaper, and more efficient, that's something in my book I can't ignore. And that's the blockchain. Then that leads on to cryptos and stuff. But let's, that, the blockchain to me uh, is, is something that will change every industry in the next one to 30 years. Yeah. And that uh, elimination of the middleman, I mean, is there any industry where that is more desperately needed than the financial industry? Oh, I know. Really? I know. Just imagine having a decentralized uh, you know, DeFi, decentralized finance, where you don't have to deal with, oh my goodness. I had to call, this is a quick, funny story. I I, I sold Penn Financial Group, my money management firm uh, on October 1st and, and shifting some things in my life around. And I had to close out a corporate account and there were some stocks in it and I didn't have access to it anymore. So I had to call my broker and I said, hey, you know, I've had a relationship with you guys for 18 years. Can you just sell these and, you know, ACH some money over it? He goes, absolutely, sir, but it's going to cost you $25 per trade. I said, who pays the trade anymore? He goes, well, it's broker assisted. I'm like, I have no access. He goes, I got you. I said, I'm doing the math. I'm like, that's a thousand dollars. I said, are you out of your mind? I didn't pay it. Obviously I argued for about an hour to get through it, but that's, that just shows the middleman. There's no reason that should cost anything because it costs them nothing to hit the button. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah. So I, I agree that the, the, the industry that we're in really needs to be upended. Well, even, okay. So that's uh you know, that's a sort of very specific application. I totally agree with it. But I, what did I do? I did something recently that drove me crazy. Oh, I think I made a, like a, 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 a card payment, you know, um, on, I, you know, I just pay off my credit card randomly because I don't actually borrow money on it. I just, you know, stack up miles, right? So I just pay it off randomly here and there. I don't think about the day of the week. I paid it off Friday because I bought something Thursday or whatever. It didn't clear until Tuesday, I guess, because of the holiday. I mean, oh, yeah. that's insane. We're just talking about, <laughs> I mean, I think I spent a couple of thousand bucks on something. Or, and I was like, yeah. what? A, you know, a couple, like two or three thousand dollars. And it didn't close for like really four days. That yeah. is totally unacceptable. And the blockchain is like, that's gone. Settlement is a on the blockchain is it's a done deal. That one thing could create. I mean, I, the massive wealth creation of just solving settlement is probably incalculable. Oh yeah, you, I mean, I, I don't have the number in front of me, but the the amount of num money that travels across borders just every day, you know, money going it's and how much it costs and and how inefficient it is. Yep. That's going to be done in seconds. Yeah, for pennies on a dollar of that. Yeah, yeah. money home to Mexico. What you know, people going to like, uh, you know, Western, like Western Union, Union, right? No, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> that's that's ridiculous. It's gone. It's twenty twenty one, and people are standing in line at Western Union. <laughs> and I understand that they're they're not wealthy individuals, but that's not the point. The point is, it's so damn cheap to move bits, and all money is electronic anyway. So the whole thing exactly. is just silly. You know, the example you gave, you know, they're like, well, you know, it was a banking holiday. It wasn't a business day. Computers don't take business days. Yeah. It's still running. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's that's yeah. So, I, you know, with the blockchain, you know, we could sit here for literally hours, if not days, about how many you know applications it could be used in. It, it, and, and that's what excites me when when I see something that has such a you know, what we call a TAM, total addressable market. It's just so big when it comes to the blockchain. And, um, you know, ARK Investing, I don't know if you follow them and all that, Kathy Woods, they have a great research arm. And they did a paper about two years ago on um, just basically disruptive technology. And they showed the economic impact of some really big things going back to the late 1800s or late 18th century, from the steam engine to electricity to automobiles, you name it. And all the stuff they're talking about now, and, and they kind of put into five categories. Um, I believe it's uh, blockchain, energy storage, DNA sequencing, robotics, and artificial intelligence. If you look at a chart, it's like a little blip, little blip from electricity, from steam engine, and then these five, it, it's just, it's parabolic. How much economic impact that, that this convergence that will take place, and again, I call it the roaring 2020s, the convergence that will take place, and then how much effect that will have on companies and the equity market. So as an investor, for me, I'm a long-term investor. If I'm buying something now, I'm looking out, you know, five to 10 years. And I'm willing to let stocks go up and down along the way. 
And I realize they all won't work out, so I'll take a basket approach and buy several in a sector. But I, I couldn't be more excited. And it's not like I'm looking through rose-colored glasses. I truly believe in the innovation that we're seeing. And unfortunately, too many people are scared of the future, not just the markets, but scared of the future in general. Most studies, they show, if they, if they ask people what, what worries them or what concerns them, it's just a very simple question. It's usually their children, which is the future, uh, their health, which is the future, or simply the future. And it's it's amazing that 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 we get so concerned about the future. Instead of looking and saying, wow, how amazing can things be in the future? Instead of looking negatively on it. Right. So when I think of the kind of investor you are, Matt, I just think to myself, long term is the first thing that comes to mind. Because you, uh, maybe even more than anybody I know, I have to think about that because I know a lot of people from doing this show, you know, certainly in the top four or five of the more than 100 or 150, however crazy many people we've interviewed, you, you got to be in the top five of truly long term looking past all the dips and blips and bear markets even as a guy who just focuses. And I have to say that is it's highly unusual and it accounts for many of the excellent calls you've made over the years. I know you've had a, had a lot of like, not just triple digit baggers, but like four digit, you know, thousand percent or more baggers. And and let's face it, Matt, the only way you get that, it's time, you know? Yes. It takes time to, to yeah. compound at those rates. So how do you do it? How do, how do you have such discipline to stay focused so religiously on the long term? <laughs> 20 years in this business finally i learned what i should be doing yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what i feel like you know when i first started managing money 18 years ago i you know anytime the market would be down i'd be losing sleep my ex-wife would it didn't help our relationship put it that way ex-wife i you know I, I took every up and down the market personal so first of all you realize the market doesn't care about you so it's not personal and then it just for me then it's probably two things one looking at the charts and seeing that Every big winner, whether it be a 5X, 10X, 100X winner, did not go straight up. Multiple bear markets along the way, multiple recessions along the way. Look at Amazon. How many times that stock pulled back 25% or more? Several times over, over, over its lifetime. But their only way to get those huge gains was to hold through that. You know, it, again, hindsight, okay, it looks pretty easy to hold on Amazon because a lot of them that fell 50% ended up going down 100%. But that again is why I take a basket approach and don't put all my eggs in one basket and diversify. The other thing is just to continue reading. But the more that I read um, and see, you know, where the where the trends are going, and and just kind of re reiterating to myself that these trends are real. It's not something I, I can't turn on TV and because Tesla is a bad quarter, think to myself, wow, maybe electric vehicles aren't the future, because a lot of people will think that, you know, just because they have a bad quarter. Um, it's, I've had to train my brain because I feel like human beings, Americans in general, have gone the opposite direction in the 45 years I've been on this earth. They become more instant gratification. And if it doesn't work out, I'm getting out, move on to the next one. I mean, I, you, you talk to people all the time that they call themselves investors, but in reality, they act like traders because they can't handle a 5% pullback. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So there's no, no easy way to, to say what I do, but that's, that's why with my subscribers, I try to get that across, that patience, think big picture. And you know, you hate to brag about winners I've had in the past, but you kind of have to just to show them, hey, I've done this before. Because otherwise, why would they take my word for it to just listen to me? Because there's too many stockbrokers out there that say, no, no, stay the course, stay the course. They really don't have a plan. That's just what they do. Oh, right. Yeah. You're, the stockbrokers always say that. They have to say buy because you know if you sell and run away, you're worthless to them. They got to keep you yeah, trading. Exactly. So let's talk about the fact that, I mean, I think I was like the sixth employee of Stansberry Research. I, I guess you must be about the 206th, but the newest one. <laughs> and um, what, uh, you know, what what attracted you to us? I'm curious. I mean, you're, you're managing money for high net worth individuals. That sounds like a cool life to me. What, why give that up for this? Yeah, you know, it's 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 funny because a lot of people have recognized I've made the move and, it's you know, just being announced where I'm, I'm going to Stansbury Research. And they all wonder, 
are, is, are you okay? What's wrong? Did something happen? And, and I was like, no, like, this is actually, this is, this is good. This is good news. You know, That's funny. again, people see change is bad. Like, why did he change? Like, you never should change. Like, and don't get me wrong. I, I, I had a great life and I have a great life because I get to wake up every morning and do what my passion is. And that is work in the stock market. But, you know, I came down to then, you know, I'm mid forties with Penn Financial Group, my, my old money management firm. It was growing very quickly. Um, I was spending a lot of time on that. I was also publishing five different newsletters. So there's only so much time in a day and I was getting a little bit burnt out. And I've always been the kind of guy, I love talking to clients, but I would rather sit behind a computer, read charts, look at stuff and come up with that stock nobody ever heard of. That, that to me is like more fun than anything. And with the newsletter business, it, it allows me to do that. And with Stansberry, to me, it's, I hate to use this analogy, I hate the Yankees, but it's kind of like going to the Yankees. You know, it's going to yeah. the, the creme de la creme. It's like going to the big leagues. Um, and, you know, looking back on my career, you know, reading Stansberry back in the day when I had my own newsletter with a couple hundred subscribers, um, thinking to myself, boy, that's where I want to be one day. Same thing with Fox News. I used to watch those guys on the weekend saying, I want to be on Fox News weekend shows one day. And I got there. So this to me was um, a goal that I had in life for a very long time. And meeting you and other Stansberry people throughout the years at conferences and doing podcasts and in the office, I really um, fell in love with the way business was done there. And I, and I, be, I made a lot of great friends and a lot of respect for what Stansberry does. And it just happened to be a really good fit for everybody involved. And uh, things fell into place at the right time. So. You know, I couldn't be happier to be here because the other thing is I want to get my my message out to as many people as possible. And Stansbury gives me that platform to get out there to as many people as possible. And I think, you know, outside of us at Stansbury, Dan, and a couple of other people, it's very tough to find independent advice that there's really no ax to grind. You know, for you and I selling newsletters, we don't make any money you know our only way that we you know we what we do for our business the better that we do for our subscribers the more subscribers we'll get it's not about churning and burning it's not about pushing certain stocks we obviously don't do that we don't take money from companies we're, we're truly independent researchers that we're only going to be around if we give good advice and it's, it's that's just a great business model to be in in my mind like put it on me let me do my job and let me actually build a business based off what i should be doing you know, instead of too many financial advisors, they just gather assets and performance doesn't matter. You know, for us, we're looking at number one for our subscribers. Yeah. From from day one, Porter started this at our kitchen table apartment at, at the apartment in in uh, Bolton Hill, Baltimore. He was all about the relationship. Actually, he was about that even before when he was just when he was working for the parent company, Agora. You know, he, he, he noticed something about the newsletter business. He thought, well, it's okay to have a really aggressive promotional stance because you want to crow about what you're doing. You want to be excited about it. And you're, and you're telling human beings about it. They're not machines. So you want to show them your passion. But why does the advice have to suck? Why can't we do real research? He said, all we have to do is do real research. And we've ratcheted the whole thing up. And he's proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was the thing to do because – the business is many, many times larger than it was when he started in it. You know, he he grew this huge thing that's worth, uh, you know, three billion bucks now. It's went public, right? So it sounds sounds right to me what you're saying. You know, this if you want to really have a great relationship and get your message across and just be passionate about what you love to do, I agree. And it's also, Matt, it's like hanging in the Louvre Museum. Forget the Yankees. We're hanging in the Louvre Museum. The line is out the door every single day for hours and hours and hours and hours. And you have to wait, you know, like if you want to see the Mona Lisa, you're waiting for hours and hours. And I'm just I'm just some, you know, lesser known romantic painter hanging on the wall somewhere as you walk <laughs> by on your way to the Mona Lisa. But I'm in the Louvre and now you are, too. And and many met. You're right. Many, many more people will see you hanging on that wall than anywhere else. And, you know, I couldn't be more thrilled uh, to have you with us because, like I said, that long-term perspective that you have, it's priceless. It's priceless. By having a bigger platform and getting out to more people, I, you know, because that long-term sounds easy. I could, you know, we could speak, speak in Vegas at a conference. People say, yeah, yeah, I get that, man, I get that. 
until we had the first bear market or the first recession. Then they say, Matt's an idiot. I can't believe I listened to this guy. So you have to, you have to have the newsletter and, and that connection with them and that trust that you build with them through the stories that we tell and through our advice or not advice through our ideas. And that builds that where when we have a pullback, they believe in us. They, 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 they're, they're believing in what, in what we're preaching and our strategies. And I think that's, key for me getting out to more people because I can't go on TV and say it once because they're never going to, they need to keep hearing it over and over and over. Yeah. It's, well, it's an unnatural act. I mean, you know, there are no atheists in foxholes. There are no long-term investors in bear markets. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's not natural. You just feel so bad. You feel kind of bad when you're down 10, 20%. And then when you're down 30, 40, 50, whatever, you throw in the towel, you take the big loss because you don't want to lose any more. And, you know, that's when people like you really shine though, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're salivating for that moment. I, I am <laughs> on the way down. It's not all fun. I mean, I still think <laughs> no. those gut punches, you know, it's, it's not all fun, but I, I do look at, you know, a normal, I mean, you have to be realistic. You're going to have corrections, 10% to 15%, probably once a year. You know, this year has been kind of strange because we didn't have our first 5% pullback uh, until September. And that, that's pretty rare. And, when we did pull back 5% finally from, the, from an all-time high in the S&P, people were freaking out. And that's, again, where you have to like talk to people, say, listen, historically, we should have had a, like a 10% pullback by now. This is okay. It, it, this is healthy. Stocks don't go up every day. Um, so, yeah, and that, that's what we're here for, you know, kind of hold their hand. I, I feel like I tell people a lot of times I'm going to shrink half the time, just kind of talking you off the ledge. It's okay. Yeah, and I'm purposely like, you know, we could get really nitty gritty. And, and it, by all means, if you have the name of a, of a stock that you're really excited about, we want to hear it. Our listener wants to hear that more than anything. But I try to steer them towards stuff that I think is more important and all this psychological stuff, especially right at this moment. Right. You know, we got the we got the five percent correction like you're talking about. And and people do freak out. You know, it's like. It's like they're in some kind of a car that can only drive on smooth road and they hit one little bump and the whole, they're afraid the whole thing's going to fall apart and, you know, leave them stranded or, or send them to the hospital or whatever. But uh, I mean, so for the listener's sake, then, you know, is there any particular name or names that you're excited about now that you do want to share with us? And if not, it's cool, too. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the problem is I, 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 I'm like the guy who's got... 70 kids i don't i love them all you know i don't i yeah. stuff like pick one. I, <laughs> I was trying to pick one for a conference in vegas and i sending over just this afternoon and i'm like gosh i have so many I, I, I you know i don't know which one to pick but one that i do like that i haven't shared with in any of my newsletters or anything before i don't even own any of it or anything it's a it, it's a it's a recently public company called matterport uh, mttr is a symbol and it's about a six billion dollar company and what they do is they make um, uh, 3D videos of buildings and of real estate. So if you ever go on Zillow or Redfin and you click on a property you like and it says it has 3D and it kind of, you know, basically you're walking through it. It's amazing. You can walk all through it. That's, matter, that's a Matterport camera and software that does that. Um, so you're seeing that really big in real estate. Uh, eventually, you're going to see that in, in a lot of buildings. Um, so uh, for security purposes, you'll see these buildings all be 3D outfits. So you know where everything is. Um, you'll see it in retail. So if you go to Matterport's website, uh, one of their examples they have, it's a soccer club over in England and it's their store and their stadium. So you could basically walk through this store and see the hat you like, click on it. You can see how many sizes they have of each one, if it fits you, what it looks like. And basically you're, it's like you're there. Take it one step further, in the next couple of years, this will all be virtual reality headsets that you'll be wearing and seeing and all this 3D software, it's gonna feel like you're right there. So. This is a company, again, recently public. Um, it's, if you look at evaluation wise, you're gonna say this is so overvalued. Uh, it doesn't meet any of the traditional metrics, to be honest with you. Uh, but it is a company that I think has, um, when you look at the TAM, the total addressable market, there's so many different um, industries that this can really disrupt, uh, starting with real estate and retail, in my opinion, and then just buildings going forward um, for engineers and other types of uh, people uh, that work on buildings. So. To me, this is exciting. This is something that's going to be the norm in the future. And it's a bit of a software play with software companies to me, uh, very scalable, uh, which I like to see, which, which is really good. Um, the other one I'll tell you, it, because this is one I've been going back and forth on buying, but I don't own any of it. And it's kind of a, it's a consumer play, but it also has a bit of a software to it. And it's called uh, Traeger, 
uh, symbols cook, C O O K. So it's those high end, high end grills. You know, I don't have one. Uh, a buddy of mine in Nicaragua has one. So, you know, it, it, the app on your phone connects to the grill. So it tells you when it's perfectly cooked. You can check on it. It's absolutely amazing, this thing. And uh, it just went public recently. It's been struggling. It hit a new 52 week low just recently. But I like the valuation on it. It's actually about to turn profitable. Uh, on an annual basis. It's got huge upside, um, uh, top line growth in, in sales. And again, just a really cool niche uh, uh, business out there that, you know, we, we look at grilling now, there's always going to be the aficionados that use coal, right? Um, I'm, that's not me. I, I need I need some, some gas or something. But you look 10 years from now, everybody's going to be cooking with their phone, checking everything, telling you when it's done. Nobody's going to have to actually go out there and look. I mean, you have the aficionados again, but uh, but a very really interesting company again that I think is being overlooked in the market because it's just not, yeah, it's not as you're not going to go on CBC and hear about this grilling company. You know, Weber, you know, the biggest one out there, uh, they just went public too uh, just a couple months ago. W E B R, and that one looks great too. The, the, both those look really, really good. And these kind of go in line with a company that went public several years ago, Yeti. You know, Y E T I, and. You know, I don't know if you have any of those Yetis. Do you have any of those coolers at all, Dan? Have you ever seen those? I, I've seen them. I'm familiar. We had uh, we had a previous guest who was a quite bullish on the company. So I, I've never had it, and I thought it was always the most overpriced. Why? Who the hell's paying that for? Like you know, so at the at the at the golf tournament a few a few weeks ago, I got one with with the, with the MarketWise logo on, and I loved it. I actually got two of them. I came home like. This is changing my life. This is it keeps everything warm or cold. It's beautiful looking. They're really, it's worth it. I get why there's this like cult around it. And Traeger has that similar following. It's cult following behind it. And um, you know, it comes down to branding. When you have a brand uh, loyal ship like that, that is that's a that's good for the stock. Yeah, that's cool. It's cool to hear about that from two different guests. So we've been talking for a while, and it's it's almost time for my final question. But I do want to tell uh, our listeners to head over to Matt broadcast.com because Matt's going to do a presentation for us and he is going to reveal the name of some tiny little stock. We can't do it now, but he thinks it'll be the best recommendation in the history of Stansbury. That is a bold call. And if it came from anybody else, I would be calling bullshit all day long. <laughs> I, I would, I would, but it comes from you and you've got, you know, Many, many huge multi-baggers. Like I said, lots of lots of quadruple digit returns in your track record. So I'm you know, I'm paying attention here. So by all means, everybody go to mattbroadcast.com if you want to learn about this and just learn more about Matt and and what he's about as an investor. That's mattbroadcast.com. But it's time for the final question, Matt. It's the same for every guest on the podcast. And it is simply if you could leave our listener with one thought today, besides going to mattbroadcast.com, <laughs> what would it be? I, I think, you know, it's a lot of stuff that we hammered today, Dan, and that's that's think big picture, think long term. Um, you know, most investors out there are retail investors, average investors. Um, you're going to live much longer than you believe, uh, in my opinion, too. So you're going to need your money to go live longer for you. And you work so damn hard for your money. Let that money work for you in the stock market. I mean, the stock market is the greatest wealth generator for the average American in the history of America. And it's not going to change anytime soon. But again, think big picture. Don't go day to day. Because I had a guy tell me on Wall Street many, many years ago when I was young and I was down there. He said, Matt, I could wake up every day and give you 50 reasons not to buy stocks today. And it's been the same way since the beginning of the stock market. And it's going to be the same way for the rest of eternity as long as the stock market's around. So again, invest in good companies and think long term. And finally, when you invest in a company, it's not a ticker symbol. It's not a, a, a bunch of letters. You're investing in a company. If you think that company will be bigger in five to 10 years from now, that's probably going to be a great investment. It's a company, people that work at a company. It's, not a, it's just not this little bunch of letters. You're actually an owner, believe it or not. So again, think big picture, think stock market, and man, let that money work for you. Oh, very well said. Thank you for that. That is, uh, I, I almost wish like every guest would answer with that question. <laughs> but, you know, it would be a boring show. But yeah, <laughs> you know, so everybody go to mattbroadcast.com. And uh, Matt, thanks for being here, man. It's always great to talk uh, to you. My pleasure. Always enjoy it. Yeah. Gr great to be on the team with you. Thank you so much, Dan. Yeah. We'll be inviting you back. Now that you're one of us, we'll be inviting you back often.
All right, thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks. I really love talking with Matt and for the reasons that I said, because he is long term focused in a highly disciplined manner. And that's really hard. And it's really the best way to be about the stock market. And it's really hard. And I guess it makes sense, doesn't it? That the hardest thing to do is the best thing to do, you know, and not everybody gets it right. But but it's there. He's right. The stock market is there every day, and there's always a reason not to invest. A previous guest named Chris Mayer, a good friend of mine from way back in, in the newsletter business, he likes to say right now is always the hardest time to invest. And it's true. There's always a reason not to do it. But over the long term, where else is the average person going to get those kind of returns? Just it's it's really hard to think of anything. So love talking with Matt. Really glad that he's he's uh, part of Stansberry Research now. I think, you know, Stansberry just it attracts the best people, man. I'm so lucky and I'm so glad that Matt is one of us now. And once again, go to mattbroadcast.com. I can't say it enough, especially if you've never heard of Matt before and you really enjoyed the talk that, that we he and I just had. Go to mattbroadcast.com and you will get more and more and more of the same. It'll be wonderful, I promise. All right. That was great. Really enjoyed it. Hope you did. Let's do the mailbag. There's a new energy space that has the world's biggest billionaires like Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, just bailing out of conventional oil investments. And they're bailing into a brand new energy space. It's this brand new place in the energy world that's expected to balloon just to go up a thousand percent, 10 times in the coming years. And I'm not talking about green energy. Okay. This is far bigger than green energy. In fact, it'll likely be the biggest tech story of the next decade. So the market for this new energy technology is already projected to be twice as big as 5G, cryptos, quantum, internet of things, and artificial intelligence combined. Now, why is that? Well, the innovation here in energy storage, it has the power to, to really bail out the power grid, which is, which is in trouble these days. And it can solve huge problems that manufacturers are having with electric vehicles too. So, if you want to learn, there's two steps that you can do to take advantage of this. This is like once a century energy shift, you know. And if you want to find out those two steps, go right now to www.newenergymessage.com. That's newenergymessage.com. Check it out. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Just send your questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms, please, to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. Or call the listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Kind of a light mailbag this week. Write in feedback at investorhour.com. Comments, criticism, anything. I love to hear from you. I really do. The first one this week is from Levi N. He says, hello, Dan. Thanks as always for all you do. Just finished the podcast with Keith Kaplan. Throughout the podcast, you praise the use of using trailing stops. You also touched on when trade stops reviewed extreme values, historical picks, and when they theoretically applied their VQ stops to your recommendations, your returns significantly improved. You do recommend stops on some of your positions, but on others you hold without a stop. Can you explain your rationale behind not using a stop? And do you think you'll change your approach or thinking on for future recommendations, mean using stops when you previously wouldn't? Thanks, Levi N. So Levi, I, I'll answer the last question first. Who knows what I'll do in the future? I'm always learning always changing, always growing. If I get better information, I can make a better decision. So I, I'm, I don't know is the answer to that. But can you explain your rationale behind not using a stop? Sure, I can. It's a matter of conviction for me. 
I would really like to not use a stop on every stock. I really would. Because I know that over the long term, if I just hold for the long term and focus on really great businesses, you're going to get phenomenal returns in the stock market. Phenomenal. These are companies, generally speaking, in extreme value. The newsletter we're talking about that, that I write with Mike Barrett, we focus on companies that have good high returns on equity, right? And really good solid balance sheets and really great businesses and really consistent margins and really gushing free cash flow. So they have all these wonderful attributes and they tend to have really great competitive advantages in the marketplace that help push these metrics consistently. So, you know, you get these high return on capital businesses and you hold them for 10, 20, 30 years. And it's what Charlie Munger from Berkshire Hathaway would call a Lollapalooza. You just, you can't make those kind of returns anywhere else. So I know that that is the best way to do it. I also know that most of my readers are, you know, novice or intermediate investors. And when they're down 20 or 25 or 30 percent or so, they're going to start getting really, really, really nervous. And if we have a down 50 or 60 percent or 70 or 80 percent, because I've had them before, in the scheme of things, I know that's not a problem, but I'm afraid they don't. And I'm afraid that they will be selling at all the wrong times and that they will not understand the true meaning of long term. So what I'm doing is I'm managing expectations. And Porter Stansberry said almost this same thing in public a few years ago at, the, at our conference. He said, you know, the best returns aren't from using trailing stops, but most people just can't. We're not, we're not cyborgs, right? We're not machines. We're humans. And you have to manage that. And I think trailing stops is the best that most people can do. And I use them for stocks that I have less long-term kind of conviction about. And I don't use them on businesses like, I mean, Costco, Starbucks. Do we need trailing stops on Costco and Starbucks? I don't think we do. And so we don't put them on there. Or Constellation Brands. Are people going to stop drinking beer and wine <laughs> anytime soon? I don't think so. They actually drank more of it in the pandemic, not less. There's a decision to be made there. Also, when I tell people to hold gold and silver and buy the Sprott gold, Physical Gold Trust and Physical Silver Trust, that's a long-term thing. I don't think I'll ever tell anyone to sell them. I, I, I've said it before. I've, I sold gold before and I regret it. I'll never do it again. And I'll always be a buyer of it and a long-term holder. And I think you should too. And I have 100% conviction about that. I don't need a trailing stop on it. I hope that I hope that explains it for you, Levi. If not, write in again and we'll talk about it some more. It's a great question. It's a great question. It's a complex topic, obviously. You know, you can hear the kind of pushing and pulling and hemming and hawing, and I'm trying to manage expectations here and help others manage their expectations and their own behavior. It's it's complicated. So it makes a great question and thank you for it. So our second and, and last question this week is from Lodovic H. Thank you once again, Ludovic. You're, you're the greatest listener, man. You write in one, two, three times a week. I love it. Keep, keep it up, man. So one of your questions this week was about when to sell. We were talking about when to sell. And you said, well, I think it depends. First of all, never take your gains for a certain position until the position is sold. In other words, I think what Ludovic is saying there is, you know, if you have a 20% gain and you sell part of the position, don't be so convinced that you're always going to have a 20% gain in the rest of the position. It's very wise. It's very simple and very wise advice. So Lodovic continues, what I think is when you are up by 25%, it is time to take some profits. When, when it is about penny stocks, take profits when they are doubled. Then simply don't look at it, Ludovic H. <laughs> That's good advice. Uh, we've we've heard similar from other folks who are really really into penny stocks. You know, they talk about taking something off the table at a double. But the the other one I'm more more curious about. You know, when you're up by twenty five percent, that seems like a really low threshold for profit taking. You must be a short term trader. Maybe you can write in and tell us more about that. When to sell is is another complex topic. 
I maintain that nobody really knows when to sell. That's why most people need trade stops. It's not that trade stops is the best time to sell, although it does a very good job over the long term. It's that it's a consistent sell program that keeps you from selling out at the bottom and taking a catastrophic loss in a panic. All right. Good stuff, man. Good stuff in the mailbag. Love it. That's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I really enjoyed it. We provide a transcript for every episode. Go to www.investorhour.com. Click on the episode you want. Scroll all the way down. Click on the word transcript and enjoy. If you like this episode, send someone a link to the podcast and help us grow. Anybody you know who might enjoy the show, just tell them to check it out in their podcast app or at investorhour.com. And do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. On Facebook and Instagram, our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. If there's a guest you want me to interview, drop me a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com or call the listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell me what's on your mind to hear your voice on the show. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.